Hello, everyone. Today, we have a special guest, Ali Reza Salahi Nayat, who is a part of our working group. Uh, and he's going to talk about how to review and deal with peer review in academic publishing. Uh, today, I will not be the one moderating the talk. It will be Irene, and she is joining us from Georgia. So could you please turn your video on? Let's see if it works. Yes, Hello. here is Hello. Irene. Hello. Hi, Irene. Over to you. Hi. Hello. Hello, we're both so, here. We're both very here. welcome, Ali Reza. Very, very welcome, Irene. The reason I'm not moderating is because Irene is actually a leader of our ethical publishing and dissemination working group. And so the floor is yours, Irene and Ali Reza. So um, Ali Reza, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we are we're really looking forward for your presentation. So. Yeah, share your, your, if you could share your presentation and present yourself. Sorry, Alireza, are you hearing me? You are muted. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, perfect. So thank you so much for being with us today, Alireza. Uh, if you could present yourself quickly. Uh, and uh, here in Georgia, we are all looking for, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, the Faculty of All the Studies, University of Tehran, and uh, I'm also the head of uh, integrity, Survey Integrity Group of INAI, and I have some experience in uh, reviewing manuscripts, and uh, I have some editorial experience working with different publishers and journals, including Sage, Springer, Nature, uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, peer review and how to deal with peer review, which can benefit both potential reviewers and authors. So first we will provide a brief history, uh, the types of peer review and the recent developments, and then we will build upon and how a manuscript is reviewed, which can benefit both uh, reviewers and authors, and each section of the manuscript should be ev evaluated, and uh, the types of revision and examples of constructive feedback. And finally, uh, how to become a reviewer and uh, how to respond to reviewers' comments as an author. The goal of this presentation is to provide an outline of the important steps to follow when reviewing a manuscript, with focus on the reviewer's role in the peer review process. So first let's define what peer review is. Peer review, an important element uh, in the production of a scholarly work is a formal system of examining scientific work prior to its publication. Uh, Referent literature defines the boundaries of scientific knowledge and serves as the mechanism for advancing the science. Thus, peer reviewers are essential partners with authors and journal editors to the effort to create and maintain uh, the official record of the discipline. So here is a, uh, here is a review of the history of peer review. William Hewell uh, was an English polymath, scientist, and young priest, philosopher, and historian of science, who is regarded as the pioneer of peer review. As you can see, the peer review dates back to 1665, and over the years, uh, naturally, it has been to different trans transitions. Well, the modern form of peer review uh, can be dated back to uh, 1845 and 
uh, different forms of peer review. Again, it uh, was another important turning point was in 1991, where they used uh, email and FTP servers for freely sharing uh, unreviewed physics preprints. And uh, PLUS ONE, uh, that's uh, an open access journal, also is an important uh, turning point in peer review concerning the number of uh, manuscripts that they publish. Because uh, throughout history of peer review and academic publication, uh, there have been different purposes for peer review. At some point, considering that uh, the number of articles that could be published were quite limited, how peer review was perceived was different. Launching plus one changed that understanding uh, because there are many mega open access journals that uh, they mainly publish all and articles that can fit the scientific rigor. Now, peer review is critical because it improves the quality of the published paper it ensures previous work is acknowledged through the literature review and proper referencing and citations. It determines the importance of the finding and their accuracy. It detects plagiarism and fraud, which is very important. And it plays a central role in academic career development, as how in many countries nowadays, even uh, PhD students are required to uh, published in peer review journals before submitting in dissert their dissertations, and the same way that academic promotions from assistant professor to associate professor or full professor also requires publications in uh, peer review journals. Now, the three main, or let's say, most common types of peer review is the traditional or single blind in which the, the peer reviewers know the names of the authors, but the authors do not know the names of reviewers. Double blind indicates that the reviewers do not know the name of the authors and the authors do not know the name of the reviewers. Open peer review refers to the type in which authors know who the reviewers are and the reviewers also know who the authors are. In some journals, if the manuscript is accepted for publication, uh, the names of review reports are also published alongside in the article. Now, in addition to these type, three types, we have other types of peer review. We have the transparent type, which refers to, which is very similar to the open review, and it refers to when the accepted uh, when manuscript is accepted for publication the contents of the reviewer's report is openly available however the name of the reviewers is not revealed at that point then we have interactive and collaborative type uh, which also is uh, practiced by some uh, journals particularly in philosophy or life sciences which uh, usually refers to interaction between the reviewers or between the reviewers and authors to facilitate the review process. The process can be open or anonymous. Then we have post-publication open peer review, which is operated by a journal that takes place after the manuscript is published. Then we have post-publication common thing, which means public common thing that takes place on a published article. It can be anonymous, for example, uh, Popier or fully open, for instance, PubMed Commons or facilitated by a journal. Now, in this case, the difference is that uh, the manuscript are usually have undergone the peer review and after the publication, still the public can comment on them, which is different from post-publication open peer review. Then we have preprint common thing, and as you know that there are many uh, preprinting repositories where authors can submit their work and uh, the public can comment uh, on the articles that share in, in uh, preprint archives or surveys. And again, commenting can be anonymous or open. We have also transferable type of peer review. Now, it, it can be anonymous, single blind, double blind, 
or open, but it can be transferred, allows the subject related journals to transfer the reviewed manuscripts. Uh, for instance, many large publishers uh, can permit this, that if you submit it to one of their journals, then they can accept the review for another. The, the example would be a spinal cord published by Nature and a spinal cord cases also published by Nature. And our example is triple blind, when the identity and affiliation of uh, authors is anonymized for the handling editor as well. Uh, some journals also use internal peer review, which is conducted by the editorial staff of the journal. For instance, uh, very well reputed journals like Science, Nature, Nature Medicine, uh, Atheor to this model, or even a smaller journals. And then we have external, which uh, it would be the general focus of uh, our discussion today, where the editing editor invites experts in the field to peer review the manuscript and makes a decision based on the submitted review reports. Um, well, I have to, sh okay, now I can see my other screen. Uh, well, here the criticism of the three main types, which is single blind, double blind and open. Uh, as you can see, uh, the main advantage of single blind is that reviewers can criticize without any influence being exerted on the, them by the authors. And uh, the disadvantage would be that it does not protect the authors from gender or any other sort of bias. And it is also a common uh, peer review policy in many subject areas such as uh, physical sciences. A double blind, of course, it, its main advantage would be that uh, the, uh, the reviewers will not be influenced by who the authors are. For instance, uh, studies suggest that when reviewers know uh, a paper is written by grad students, they may have uh, certain bias towards it or different sorts of bias depending on the author's uh, nationality and affiliation. Uh, the disadvantage would be that it's difficult in practical terms to fully anonymize authors and reviewers, although uh, still uh, it, it can be done, but because self-citation, depending on a subject and a presentation style, this may happen. Uh, and it is also, it happens that sometimes the authors refer to a work that the data for it is already available in certain repositories. It's also common in social sciences and humanities. And we have the open type of review that its advantage is to increase its transparency and credibility. Um, of course, as an editor, I have experienced that even for journals with uh, high impact factors, that sometimes reviewers do not really provide good reviews. Uh, particularly when it's single blind or even double blind, but when it's open, uh, so their name is revealed to the authors, or we say that uh, the content of the review would be published, or example, for Frontiers Journal, uh, where the names of reviewers will be published without uh, publishing the content of their reviews. Usually we have a different uh, approach uh, from reviewers in how rigor uh, they would account in conducting the reviews, particularly when they favor revisions. Now, again, for rejection, <laughs> they may uh, stick to a couple of lines or a short paragraph, or if it's a good paper and they want to recommend an acceptance, still the same. But uh, generally, they would do more work, uh, particularly for revisions. Uh, here you can see uh, the survey results where we ask authors and reviewers that how they prefer different types of uh, peer review for the journals if uh, they want to publish their own manuscript or uh, they are willing to, to review for a journal that has this type of uh, peer review. As you can see, single blind and double blind are the most popular choices that are uh, for, uh, 
for authors uh, submitting their own manuscript to a journal or, or, or for those researchers who want to review manuscripts for these type of journals. Uh, as you can see, open peer review is not very popular uh, amongst uh, researchers. Now, here are the reasons that why you should conduct peer review. Of course, you can say that um, it's one social responsibility and academic duty. But uh, in addition to that, it also helps you with your own research. Reviewing many manuscripts over the time can also help you to write better uh, articles yourself. It is also good for your career development uh, and awareness of new research studies before their publications and before your peer. There is also general interest in the area, uh, which are amongst the grounds that in our surveys review, reviewers gave us. Now, according to surveys that we conducted, uh, well, the main reason for, according to 93% of the participants, that, that playing a part as a member of the community was their chief reason for conducting reviews. And 83% also mentioned enjoy helping to improve the paper. And 74% mentioned that uh, incorporating others reviewing work and to other reasons, as you can see, that increase the chance of publication in the same journal or joining that journal's editorial board. Different journals have different peer review process because they have different structures. Some journals uh, have editor-in-chiefs, and they have uh, associate editors, and they have editorial boards. It's quite different. Some may use internal uh, editorial board members for peer review. But generally speaking, uh, this is the model that is practiced by many journals. So after the author submits an article to the journal, the journal editor screens the paper for plagiarism and uh, for checking it's whether the, the content of the manuscript aligns with their aims and scope, and then they send it to two reviewers, or sometimes to three, but usually they, they send it to two reviewers. And then depending on the reviewer's comments, uh, the editor uh, makes a decision for rejection or you know, their request for uh, more revision. They may request a third reviewer to join, um, and then finally the paper could be accepted. So if you were invited to review a manuscript, uh, there are things you should consider. First is your availability. For instance, uh, if you are too busy, you cannot uh, conduct the review. It would be the best to reject it. By accepting to review a manuscript, while well, you know you cannot uh, return it on time, uh, you're not actually doing any favor to the editors or the authors because it would significantly delay uh, the peer review process. Then it's your area of expertise. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor. I consider myself as a social scientist, but I reviewed for many medical journals. And uh, at the editors, they know that I do not have an MD, or I tell them if it's the first time that they invite me uh, to conduct a review for them, to tell them that I can merely comment on, for instance, certain areas. Uh, on the research methodology or, you know, the results and the analysis, not the medical parts of it. Uh, of course, I publish in medical sciences as well. It goes the same thing. Sometimes uh, journal editors may invite people with expertise in certain area, for instance, uh, a person to merely assess the statistics or data analysis of a manuscript, regardless of their expertise in uh, the topic itself. And then you should also disclose, disclose your uh, potential competing interests, whether you published with any of the authors in the past, if, of course, it's a, it's a case for open or single blind where you can't see the names of the authors, whether you worked with them uh, in the same institution or previously worked with them or any personal relationships. 
uh, with any of the authors. Usually the journals uh, review these things before uh, inviting the reviewers. Nonetheless, uh, even if that happened, it's you, you, you're required to disclose this potential conflicts of interest or competing interest with uh, the editor. And then they can make a decision whether you still should review the manuscript or uh, the competing interest prevents you from doing so. And again, uh, it's a matter of confidentiality, which is very important. So here, we want to say that how you can, oh, sorry, how uh, to review a manuscript, the first impression, the first question you should ask is that whether the research is original, novel, and important to the field, and has the appropriate structure and language been used. Uh, usually, this is the first step that the editors do, but again, the, the reviewers should do the same. Uh, then you review the title and the abstract, uh, and you ask whether the title accurately reflect the research question in a study type. Uh, as a reviewer or editor, you should recommend, for instance, if it's a case study, it should be reflected in the title. Uh, if it's a case study in a certain country, again, they should do the same and avoid uh, generalization. And about the abstract, as you know, uh, different journals have different uh, guidelines and structures for the abstract. Some of them could be unstructured, which is very common in social sciences and humanities, uh, or whether it should be structured, which is the most common type in uh, medical sciences, and whether it's really a summary or not. And does it include key findings? Is it uh, an appropriate length? Again, that depends on uh, the journal guidelines. And is anything presented in the abstract that wasn't described in the main paper? Then you review the introduction, that whether it's effective, clear, and well-organized. Does it really introduce and put into perspective what follows? and suggest changes in organization and point the authors to appropriate citations. And be very specific. Don't write the authors have done a poor job. Uh, you should be very specific about uh, what went wrong and what you suggest and how they should improve it. Methodology, in my opinion, is the most important part of a research paper. And actually that's where, uh, it, you can't distinguish uh, professional research from academic research. Uh, can a colleague reproduce the experiment and get the same outcomes? Now, uh, it's a very important question. So the authors are required to provide appropriate uh, information, adequate information about their sampling, what they did, what was their theoretical framework, conceptual framework, and whether the sampling was appropriate and so on and so forth. And of course the references uh, should be checked and uh, the description of any new methodology is accurate if they claim to be so. And could or should the authors have included supplementary materials, for instance, the data or they used uh, uh, another uh, researcher's data. So you should check about the subject selection. Then it's about the validity, uh, the ability to measure what you intended to measure, internal validity, and whether it has external validity, particularly when you're conducting surveys. It's about the reliability. You, you, as a reviewer, you should check the ability to uh, measure consistency, expect to see the same results if the, if the research is conducted in a different setting and in the kinder of the reproducibility. And then it's about rep reproducibility, which is the ability of the experiments uh, to be duplicated and how validity and reproducibility are checked. Sampling is also very important and you should see if it's clear how subjects or samples were selected 
and are the eligibility, inclusion, and exclusion criteria clearly stated? Now, of course, even if they stated this uh, sampling appropriately and adequately, sometimes you need to advise the authors that uh, the sampling may not be appropriate or they cannot uh, claim certain conclusion based on sampling. Now, if they conducted uh, convenient sampling uh, for a group of, uh, for a population that they should have used for purpose for sampling, of course, you should tell them that they cannot reach certain conclusions due to their sampling flaws. Uh, and is every subject or sample accounted for? And can the sample set to be compared to other studies? And can the sample set be generalized to the whole population? Again, you should check the sampling by us. Opportunity sampling, for instance, where only the most convenient subjects are available. Volunteer sampling that may share uh personality characters or uh, a strata of sampling that refers to potential of selection bias in the defined sample groups and random sampling uh, for instance may result in unbalanced demographic clusters again uh, even if a paper is, uses um, an appropriate sampling model that doesn't mean it essentially cannot be published and you should understand that uh, Issues with sampling and sometimes methodology means that uh, you should decide as a reviewer or clearly recommend it to the editors as reviewers that whether it's possible that these things be changed or not. Now, of course, everybody tries for uh, controlled trials, particularly randomized sampling most appropriately. But if, for instance, they conducted a series of interviews or a survey based on convenience sampling, uh, you should understand that it's uh, in most cases it would be impractical or even impossible for the authors to change that. Uh, they they cannot because it requires them to conduct a new survey. If you believe that this cannot be done, of course you should recommend it to the editor. That uh, considering the fact that this is impractical, then recommend that whether the paper still can be published with certain. Uh, provisions or you believe that this is not publishable in the journal. Again, uh, for results and discussion section, you suggest improvements in the way that data is shown, comment on the general logic and the justification of interpretation and conclusions, comment on the number of figures, tables, and schemes write consist, uh, concisely and precisely which changes you recommend, list separately, suggest the changes in a style, grammar, and other small changes. Uh, note that you should not correct them yourself as a reviewer or editor. Suggest additional experiments or analysis if necessary. Make clear the need for changes or updates and ask yourself whether the manuscript should be published at all. You should comment on the importance, validity, and generality of the conclusions. Request toning down of unjustified claims and generalization. Request removal of redundancies and summaries. And again, another thing that uh, happens is that sometimes the same text that you can see in the abstract is uh, repeated in, uh, in the introduction and sometimes the conclusion, the same text. You should request to avoid redundancies. And uh, the abstract, not the conclusion, should summarize the study. As for references, tables, and figures, you should check uh, the accuracy, number, and citations, their appropriateness, uh, comments on the any footnotes, uh, and you should also note that some journals do not have footnotes or endnotes. Uh, comment on figures, their quality and readability. Uh, also assess the completeness of legends, headers, and access labels. Check presentation consistency. Comment on need for color in figures. 
as you know, uh, many journals are not online only. So they have a printed copy, they have an online copy. And uh, if figures are in color, they may amount for certain uh, fees, uh, burden for the authors, and you should comment whether it's necessary or not. And if it's in gray scale, uh, you should also comment whether it's readable or not. Now, when reviewing the manuscript, you shouldn't uh, do these things. If the language and grammar are such that the article is difficult or impossible to understand, do not proceed with the review. If the manuscript can be understood but has many uh, language and grammar issues, do not try to fix this. Instead, suggest to the editor that the authors need to have the manuscript edited. And do not spend time polishing grammar or spelling. However, do mention grammatical errors that uh, affect proper understanding. After you review the manuscript, now you have to write it. First, remember you should be professional and courteous, even if you wanna reject the paper, <laughs> If the authors uh, made substantial errors in methodology, they made uh, unacceptable claims, still try to be professional and courteous. Read the whole paper and refer to guidelines before writing anything and use an appropriate structure for your report. First, provide the summary of the strengths, weaknesses, and overall contribution. Then provide the major comments and finally minor comments. Remember that the objective is to advance knowledge. So here are examples of constructive feedback. Uh, suggested areas for feedback are, for instance, acknowledge your understanding of the author's work in two or three sentence summary. Uh, example of unhelpful comments would be that this article does not relate to the title or this article is confusing. Constructive comments would be like, uh, this article is a synthesized literature review of the use of text messaging to motivate patients with diabetes. The use of innovative technologies in managing these complex diseases is often unclear and varies depending on the setting. And I commend uh, the authors for attempting this project. Thank you for the opportunity to review this manuscript and then you will continue referring to their contribution, the major comments you have on the methodology introduction, and then uh, the minor comments, which are, for instance, the changes in uh, graphs, the number of them, or even grammatical errors. So generally it's uh, suggested that the reviewers should first give the positive feedback. So don't say nice job or nice article, but need some editing. Uh, it would be appropriate to write something like this. Uh, this article is well written and the topic is of great significance given the recent controversies and debates on the topic in the literature. The figures and charts at great to the manuscript. Please remember that the readership of the journal is international, so please clarify terminology so readers everywhere will understand your message. Again, in another survey that's we ask editors that what makes good reviewers generally is that uh, they provide a true and comprehensive report. It's very important that they submit the reports on time uh, and they provide well-founded comments for authors, give constructive criticism, uh, they demonstrate objectivity and provide a clear recommendation to the editor. So here's a question uh, I would like to ask participants. Uh, who do you think is responsible for the ethics 
in uh, publishing articles, for instance, do you believe that uh, uh, this is uh, the ethics uh, lies with the publisher, its responsibility of the editorial team, reviewers, authors, or funding bodies? Here in Georgia, how it is that they say all of them. I wonder what yes. our online participants have to say. <laughs> yes, in fact, they all are responsible uh, for the ethics. Uh, for instance, many reviewers have uh, the tendency, or even editors have the tendency to believe uh, certain ethical aspects of the paper, particularly when it comes to data, then they have certain funding bodies. For instance, if the manuscript reads that we acknowledge uh, receiving funding from A and B and C, you believe that those funding bodies usually deal with the data. So the reviewers and editors are more forgiving whether the data itself are duplicated, replicated, or manipulated. And you will uh, focus more on the text itself, that whether it's plagiarized, it's recycled or not. And uh, we can see that the comments also suggest that uh, everybody is responsible in this area. And again, I should also note that uh, the editorial themes usually assess the manuscript uh, using certain uh, plagiarism detection software. But um, you should note that uh, certain sorts of misconduct, for instance, recycling cannot be detected by, uh, by these tools. And that's why it is also the responsibility of reviewers to notice if there is any certain mismatch between citations, references, or hallucinations uh, which is a common thing by AIs, if it's AI generated. And then they can recommend it to the editors that it requires uh, further detection or is suspected. So it's an important question, how to detect research misconduct, whether you're a reviewer or editor. Now, most publishers uh, provide editors or editorial assistants with certain tools that they can check the manuscript against uh, different uh, pleasures and detection tools. But again, as I mentioned, it's about inconsistencies. For instance, uh, you can see that there is inconsistency among citations and references, which would be a good tool. Uh, whether you believe that uh, there is certain incoherence in the text that may suggest certain parts could be copied from elsewhere or how an AI may write certain text. For instance, it's hallucinating certain parts or they make uh, inaccurate claims, which doesn't make sense from a scientific perspective. Uh, another part would be the data itself, of course. Now, there are different types of plagiarism, uh, as you know, but again, you should consider the types of plagiarism their extent, originality of the copied material, uh, the context, whether it's about referencing or attribution. Uh, again, the intentions should be considered, author seniority and language. Uh, even before the rise of uh, generative AI that uh, many authors and students use nowadays, since late 2022, which became quite popular. Even before that, uh, many authors who, who wanted to publish in English, but they were not native English language speakers, would usually ask someone else to help them. In such criteria, sometimes we witnessed that uh, certain errors happened, but uh, they were not intentional. Again, scenario, the seniority of the author is a different matter, uh, that whether it, you should be more forgiving because uh, if you believe that graduate students uh, made some errors, for instance, it was a single paragraph, uh, you, you have a different approach about how you should forgive them or whether uh, it's done by a full professor.
Now, here you can see the common forms of research misconduct in Iran, um, again, but it, it can be applicable to other countries as well. Uh, in terms of citations, you can see that uh, invalid sources is one example, using secondary sources only is uh, another. Then in terms of text, you can see that recycling is the most uh, Difficult one to detect. Uh, duplication is another form. Paraphrasing is very common. Re repetitive research or salami slicing is, again, another common type of uh, misconduct, particularly in medical sciences. For instance, they conduct uh, one survey, but they publish the results in three articles, while it should be in one. Uh, again, in authorship, we can see that uh, misleading attributions, and uh, we have unethical co-contributions, including gift authorship, ghost authorship. In terms of data, it's very important to consider data falsifications, data manipulation, including data fabrication, duplication. Uh, they, are, they are very uh, common. Article at once for a conference, I received a manuscript that uh, the, 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 the authors conducted a survey and I believe only 12 or 15 participants, and they made a huge claim. I rejected the paper, and uh, they were very unlucky because uh, two weeks later from a different conference, I received the very same manuscript. Instead that this time, instead of uh, 15 participants, it was 150. So they definitely did not have a new uh, population. They didn't conduct a new survey. It was they just you know added a zero to that. Uh, full at 10, and they resubmitted the manuscript. So they were very unlucky that I was the reviewer of their paper, but these things happen. And uh, as a reviewer or editor, you should be very vigilant in detecting these things. So here is a case of study, uh, and I would like that the participants provide your comments. Reviewer, It's a case of study for reviewer bias or competitive harmful acts by reviewers. Uh, it's a case 124 by COPE. Submission of the paper is by reviewers. And here's the case. An editor sent out the paper to three reviewers. One of them who gave the paper a favorable review and closed the research letter on the same topic uh, with, in his view, a better study design. He told the editor that the author of the paper had encouraged him to submit it during a meeting they both attended. He added that he thought its inclusion would make a good complementary pair of papers. The editor sent the research letter to the two other reviewers who had reviewed the first paper. The paper's design was criticized by all three reviewers and the paper was rejected. The peer reviewer, the peer review of the research letter is ongoing but is so far favorable. Did the editor act correctly in having the research letter reviewed as well? Is it fair to reject the paper, but accept the research letter? An author sends uh, an article to the journal and the editor assigned three uh, reviewers to review the manuscript. One of the reviewers submitted a research letter, a letter to the same journal to be published and he explained that uh, the author encouraged him to do so. Now, the letter is also peer reviewed. The research article is also peer reviewed. Now, the research letter has favorable reviews, which means it can be published, but the research article that was originally submitted is going to be rejected. 
because of the criticism of uh, the research design. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll it as a here. Uh, they are asking what the research letter contains. Can you be more specific about the research letter? The research letter, but usually letters build upon uh, articles. For instance, you have an article uh, discussing uh, media and information literacy in uh, uh, amongst a college student in a certain city. And then you wrote a, a research letter addressing perhaps the general topic of, for instance, media and information literacy, or maybe you wanna talk about, uh, for instance, uh, media and information literacy as a curriculum, something like that. So they are actually, uh, you know, complement one another. But anyhow, that regardless of the topic, uh, This is what was discussed during the coping. The reviewer had used his position by discussing the paper with the author. He should have not because it's a violation of confidentiality. When the reviewer, the third reviewer mentioned that, you know, he talked with the author and, you know, the author knew that he is going to submit this. He should also have declined to review the paper due to the close association with his own research. A referee might review a paper badly because it is not in their interest to see similar work published before their own. So again, this is a conflict of interest that maybe that's the reason that the original article was was rejected. The paper should have perhaps been sent to new reviewers, although editors often select people in the same areas to review and if it's a small area of research, the choice of referees can be very limited. For instance, uh, you're an editor for a journal, you receive a manuscript with a certain case of study that uh, they are going they, that there was a study, regardless of the discipline, uh, it was a case of study in a certain country. If you know amongst your reviewers or editorial board members, somebody who belongs to that country, you usually include them as reviewers. It's it's very uh, it, it's a common practice. And for that reason, uh, sometimes you have a small pool of uh, referees that you can refer to. And again, no harm has been done as the authors of the letter openly admitted his conversation with the other author and had been encouraged to uh, submit it. And the editor was therefore right to review the letter in the usual way. So here is another case of study, but uh, I would like to know that whether our webinar was for 60 minutes or uh, 120, if Rita could kindly clarify that. Oh, okay, so we are going to finish it in 10 minutes. I made a mistake, I assume it was 90 minutes. So it's 60. So I'm going to skip the second case of study and the third. Oh, and maybe we can uh, review the fourth case study. This would be an interesting one uh, about the authors displaying bullying behavior towards the handling editor. It's also the case 28. It's similar to 8.17 of COPE. Um, A handling editor rejected the paper without review after consulting with a senior editor, which it happens, this rejection. The corresponding author sent an appeal about two weeks later where he requested that the paper be given a second chance and be sent for peer review. He added that in case of a new decision to reject without review, the editor should provide a detailed response to a number of questions and comments raised in the appeal letter. He also mentioned that in order to illustrate the importance of the study, he had done a social media poll asking whether the paper in question was more relevant to the journal's readership than author's paper whose uh, link 
he provided in a poll and that uh, had badly recently been published in the journal. Uh, the appeal was also read by another senior editor, and it was agreed to reject the paper again without providing any detailed explanation as the behavior was considered borderline bullying. This happened even for a conference. <laughs> Three weeks after the second rejection, the corresponding author uh, contacted the journal expressing his disagreement, disappointment with the decision and threatened a freedom of information request to access the correspondence between the editors that led to the uh, editorial decision. Moreover, he suggested he would be writing about his negative experience with the journal. The handling editor perceived this as aggressive and litigious behavior and shared the correspondence with the head of the research section of the journal, responded to the author and coped with the senior author in the correspondence. The senior author responded by acknowledging the inappropriate behavior of the author and promising to take action internally. So here are the questions. Did the journal handle the case appropriately? Could something else or something different have been done? And how can this type of situation be prevented? Rejected three times when no review was done. I mean, it was a desk. Senior editor and so. Uh, I lost your voice, Rita. So, so we we are we are discussing the case here. There's a perspective that the. Uh, they act inappropriately, the journal uh, with the author, uh, case of discrimination, right? Yes. Um, and proper way was to, to offer to write a the discovery because no reviewer were involved that I understand. It's a journal, not a yeah. um, So, so uh, another. Um, Another topic that was discussed here uh, is that opening uh, the case to the to to the to the committee um, to 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 make the, the process more transparent. Uh, sorry, Alides, we really need to wrap up now. Sure. So the answer is that in terms of what the journal could do to future situation. Well, basically, I'm going to wrap it up because we think it takes time. In fact, uh, this rejection is a common thing, and a reviewer uh, is not essentially needed uh, when the editor decides to reject the journal because uh, depending on different journals, as you know, which have very different uh, acceptance rates, for instance, if, if you compare uh, Plus One, which is a well-known journal with about 50% acceptance rate to compare it to uh, let's say international security with less than 8%. Uh, this rejection is a common thing. You may reject, the editors may reject the paper based on uh, its aim, uh, scope, general uh, methodology flaws, because uh, particularly for smaller journals, when you want to refer the manuscript to reviewers, uh, they have a smaller resources for, to doing so. And it was also suggested that perhaps the journal should have involved the other co-authors in addition to the senior author. Uh, and again, with the benefit of the hindsight, it's possible that after the author had done the social media poll and was asking for more detail, it might have been possible to de-escalate the situation. So the recommendation that it was, although it was declined, it was inappropriate and even irrelevant to conduct the poll, but uh, the the editors could provide more reasons that why uh, the, the the that decision uh, to reject the paper. Okay, Alarezia, we're absolutely out of time now. I'm afraid um, we we really are um, because we need to we need to wrap up. Sure, so uh, finish it in just this okay. is the conclusion. 
uh, how to handle the peer review for others is that uh, always address substantial in terms of substance, uh, substantive, in terms of your analysis and arguments to the point. Answer politely, answer completely. Do not ignore anything, even if you dis disagree with them. Answer with evidence, uh, it's very important. Don't ignore any comments, even if, again, you disagree with them, or if you believe that it was already answered, or even if uh, your comments uh, would, uh, re revising the manuscript would uh, make it uh, longer than the required guidelines. Ha handle all minor edits, spelling mistakes, and so on and so forth. And uh, always be optimistic because when usually you know you're provided with a revision, that means the paper can be published. So if anybody has any questions, I would be. I think we're really out of time. What I'd like to do, Ali Rezi, is just is just ask everybody to give you a a big round of applause for for an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you. And my apologies. I, I assume that uh, it would be 90 minutes, not 60 minutes. So, so, okay. So not, not, not sorry, but if anyone has any questions, if you want to put them in the chat now, uh, we can we can deal with them offline. So thank you very much indeed. It's a really excellent talk. Very interesting. I've got some questions for you as well, but we'll we'll do them offline. Yeah. Sure. Thank you very much, everyone. And our yeah. next webinar will be in November. Um, it will be with uh, Thomas as well, talking about with Antarnitin. Uh, you have the details shared soon in the NI website. The recording and the presentation from this webinar will be made available at, on the NI website and our YouTube channel. So please keep up with us for our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.